I'm Jim Grazard. I specialise in reconstructing Viking Age metal working practice. What I'm doing here is heating up a crucible so that I can melt silver in it. The silver goes into that ceramic crucible, which is very much like this one, which has been used earlier. So I can pick that up. Goes up to around about 900 degrees, melts the silver, which will then pour out into an ingot mold like that one, making this kind of silver ingots, which are the kind that we find in hoards of uh, Viking Age silver from the Galloway hoard, from the Cuerdale hoard, and this was used as currency in the Viking Age. They were swapping these, selling, uh, yep, using these to buy things. They'd use scales like these to weigh out the silver, yeah, and they'd be able to yeah, buy stuff with it. This is how kings paid armies. This is how yeah, craftsmen were paid for their work. And what we'll be doing here is turning scrap silver into another ingot to go into the Viking Age bullion economy. Good evening, welcome to the uh, Hawkon Hawkonson lecture for the Largs Viking Festival 2022. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Jim Glazard. I'm uh, currently a PhD candidate at the University of York. I'm uh, very aware that I'm following in some rather large footsteps giving this lecture here. Um, uh, most people uh, who, I, who I've seen normally already have PhDs where I am in the process of researching mine. So I'm going to talk to you about my PhD project, Between the Hammer and the Anvil, which is an investigation into non-ferrous metal workers of Viking Age Britain and Scandinavia. Uh, what I mean by non-ferrous metal workers is people who worked with metals other than iron. So we're talking about gold, silver, copper alloys, and, yeah, and the variations on the on those. It also includes people who worked with lead and tin as well, but for very obvious reasons I don't do too much work with lead. So what I'm going to do in this talk is talk about the, uh, the aims and objectives of the project and how I intend to achieve these aims. I'll be covering a little bit of what we know so far about craft workers and artisans that I'm investigating. I'll also take a look at the work that I've done so far in reconstructing a Viking Age, uh, Viking Age workshop at the Year Centre, which is the uh, York Experimental Archaeology Research Centre. And I'm going to talk about the future of the project, what I'm going to be doing over the next couple of years. So getting started with this, the project aims are to understand the life ways and daily experience of the non-ferrous metal workers of the Viking Age. I want to know more about the people who were responsible for the objects that I've spent the last 20 odd years or so reproducing. So the starting point is logically establishing what we can say about them with any certainty. And that requires positive identification of the tools that they used and the ways in which they made those objects. So I've broken this down into project objectives. The first is to identify the toolkits and skill sets in, used in making the objects of silver and copper alloy. And I also need to understand the working environments in which they operated. So there's multiple ways in which these objects could have been manufactured. So objective two is to establish which of these that they used. By approaching the work of these artisans through experimental testing of their methods, I hope to establish which techniques that were used and understand why they chose them. This all becomes a question of working out who these people actually were, what their cultural identity was, and how they interacted with the wider society of the Viking Age, which is what I'll be hopefully starting to touch on a little bit tonight. So the way in which I'm approaching this, uh, this is first to reconstruct the working environment of the metal workers of the Viking Age. So this is a little reconstruction drawing that I drew myself of a, of a workshop that was in, uh, excavated in 2001 in Denmark at Weibull Saunders. I'll be talking a lot more about that workshop. And I'm yeah, building a reconstruction of this at the Year Centre in York. And then once I've got the, got the workshop reconstruction, I'll be uh, fitting it out in, you know, with a half yeah, and using that for, yeah, uh, for working with the 
the, the metals in the way in a reconstruction of the way that it was done in the Viking Age. So the practical experiments I will be carrying out, I will be uh, using the uh, the workshop as a setting, as a laboratory, if you will, for our reconstruction of technical processes that can be inferred from surviving finds of Viking Age metalwork. I'll be looking into selection of crucible types uh, that will use melting metals because these vary in style from uh, in different places in the Viking world. I'll be also be looking at practical techniques used for different yeah. You have different types of metal working from wrought work, uh, joining methods and the implication of these on workshop organisation. I'll also be looking at alloys uh, that have been selected for use in making wrought and sheet metal objects such as belt fittings, ring pins and sheet objects like these kind of hook tags that you might see some people around the Viking village here using for yeah, fastening their, their leg windings. I have a rather nice set myself that I've been using today. I'll also be, I will also be looking at casting as well, although the casting methods are fairly well understood. Quite a few people have worked on that before, but it's something I've done on a regular basis. That's a reproduction of a, of a borrow style brooch from the, the, that's the picture of the original, which is from Hedrum in Norway. So I'll be doing some casting in the workshop as well, basically just so, so that it gets used in the same way that the original would have been used. Now the point of doing all this, this isn't just kind of fun activities, the point of it all is to understand the processes and techniques that were used in the original Viking Age workshop. I want to be able to reconstruct the environment and, and by using modern people as proxies for Viking Age workers, I can observe points of contact and interaction that will help understand what their life was like from a physical perspective. Yeah, it's not necessary or even, yeah, even possible really to recreate the personal experience of the Viking Age artisans, but we can see where they were placed, how they would need to move, understand their choices of where, of where to work due to light, heat, and the physical arrangement of the space. And that through this, I'm hoping to understand what their life was like and why they made the kind of choices that they did. So the starting point of all of this, I'm just going to go over now some of the actual physical evidence that we have for non-ferrous metal working from the Viking Age. This comes in the forms of things like crucibles. Uh, you know, crucibles are, for anybody that doesn't already know, crucibles are the con uh, ceramic containers that metals were melted in. Yeah, so yeah, these, uh, these are found through excavation. These are crucibles from uh, Kaupang in Norway. Uh, another selection of crucibles with some moulds and so on there from Viking Age Dublin. And while you can see that there, there's, there are some differences in shapes between them, you all do have remains of this same kind of crucible. Also, that's a, a broken yeah, piece of one, but that's, they do, uh, yeah, they, uh, that type are found in Dublin as well. And the analysis of these objects is usually done quite scientifically. Scientific analysis of these kinds of objects tells us what metals they were, they were used for working. And that's quite divorced from any sort of consideration of how they were used. The, uh, the sort of the archaeometallurgical uh, analysis tells us that, you know, what was done but not how. You, know, the, you, know, you also have uh, finds of moulds like these are uh, soapstone ingot moulds from Coppergate in York and then there's um, ceramic uh, moulds for uh, casting brooches from uh, Reba in Denmark. You also tend to find tools as well. This is a couple of pairs of, uh, of uh, tongs from the Viking Age Cemetery at Kilmay on the Island Bridge in, uh, near Dublin. Yeah, and again, those are bit, yeah, that kind of thing is found in graves, and we do find the tools of Viking Age metal workers in their graves, but there's a lot of argument over what exactly that means, whether that means that somebody was a metal worker or whether it meant that they were somebody who employed metal workers. So apart from being a useful uh, source for what the tools look like, I don't tend to pay too much attention to, to the graves of, uh, of the of, yeah, graves that have the tools in them. Let's go. Now the places where these are found, this is some of the, the kind of key sites 
for non-ferrous metal working around Viking Age Europe. I've already mentioned, uh, mentioned these moulds from Reba, so they're, they're, from, they're from there. Yeah, and these kind of moulds are uh, the sort of thing that you find in other Viking Age excavation contexts. Yeah, there's also evidence for how moulds like this were made. These are lead models that were found at Kaupang in Norway. So, yeah, those are there. And this, this is a kind of object that would be used to make a ceramic mould like this. So you see this kind of consistency of finds across uh, the different Viking Age sites. Yeah, these are um, Patrice pieces from the harbour. Uh, Hedby in, uh, in, well, in northern Germany now, it used to be part of Denmark. And these were, uh, were used for making, uh, making fine granulation jewellery. So they're evidence of some quite high status metal working that was happening there. And the, the useful, the particularly useful thing, which is not always easy for me to actually trace down in the uh, in site reports, is places where the, where these tools were actually used. So the site plan here is one from Birka in Sweden, where the post hole lines there show booths that were used as workshop space. And that's something that has been quite difficult for me to find because they don't, they don't, not that many of them occur, apart from this one. This is the, the workshop at Viborg Sonderzo in Denmark. So that's there right in the middle of the Jutland Peninsula, and that is a very rare example of a purpose-built workshop that had evidence for uh, ferrous metal working and non-ferrous metal working. So I'll be, yeah, I will be talking more about that. In uh, Britain, we have evidence for non-ferrous metal working at Coppergate, the, uh, the famous Coppergate excavations in York where one of the houses there had a hearth that was, had been adapted for use for melting metals, working with metals. Ingot moulds from Lincoln. Yeah, they also yeah, show the evidence of uh, long first metal working there. And then over to Dublin. One of the, one of the, one of the things that, to, that starts to appear in the houses in Dublin is evidence for this metal working happening in the domestic arena. So you've got houses that people are living in, presumably with families. You know, I, was, we, I saw a lecture recently by Sarah Kwa from Aarhus University saying that they found this at Reba as well, that the houses had evidence of people working metals just literally in, you know, in uh, Dublin. You know, the, the long houses at Dublin have these little rooms in the corners. Some of them were used for storage. Some of them were used for, yeah, for metal working. So while you've got the family living in the house, you also have somebody just off in the corner raising silver or, or yeah, bronze or, or brass up to you know, like 800, 900 degrees to melt it and work with it. Presumably at Dublin, there was also lots of evidence of, uh, of people using the fire that was in the middle of the house for melting lead. You know, just to you know, throw a bit of lead into a pan and. You know, mess around with it, make shapes. So they, they were doing these really, really quite ridiculously hazardous light industrial activities in the, play, the domestic uh, of the domestic context where they're also living with their families. This is uh, certainly a way we don't look at it. This is a selection of lead pieces from uh, Torxy and. Yeah, from Torxy in England, which was the overwinter camp of the great heathen army in the winter of 872-873. A metal detecting survey there has found, well, examples of, manu of test pieces for the manufacture of coins. Now, I think, the, I think I'm right in saying these coins are actually fake coins uh, in imitation of, of uh, ones that were minted by Saxon kings. But you also have, from my point of view, this far more interesting trial piece, which show, has these little triangular stamps on it. Now, those were used in the manufacture of silver bracelets uh, sil and silver jewellery. That was quite a common uh, decorative method. So the fact that somebody is testing out a triangular punch with three dots in it on that site is indi an indication that there's a metal worker there 
quite possibly the metal worker who was, who was making silver jewellery. Another example of one of these, uh, these camps is from Woodstown in Ireland, outside of Waterford, which was a temporary camp occupied by the yeah, uh, Viking army that, was, yeah, that moved into Ireland. And again, there was evidence of metal working from excavations there, or, which I've uh, illustrated here with a, uh, a weight which incorporates a piece of Irish decorated metal work uh, set into lead, and these are quite a common find on the on these marching camp sites. They, they appear to be connected with the uh, bullion economy of the Viking Age, where people are weighing out their silver to yeah, uh, to known weights uh, using yeah, using these uh, these weights and scales. The first way I can think about this is looking at you know, things like melting points. You know, gold is quite a high melting point. That's going to require you know, a, a high degree of experience and skill in, uh, in operating the fire. That's going to require skill in production of, of ceramics that will contain, you know, uh, contain the gold. Because you know, if you go much above, uh, above kind of 1100, 1200 degrees, then you start to have problems with melting your crucibles. You know, so you have a problem actually containing molten metals at that sort of level. So, yeah, silver, sterling silver, uh, yeah, has that melting point at uh, 961. You know, so it's still, yeah, it's a little bit easier to work with than gold. You don't need to get your, get your fire quite as hot, but you still need the right conditions. You know, copper alloys are, are that little bit hotter, but silver and copper alloys will work on pre in using pretty much the same tools and the same setups. Lead, you know, right down at the, at the bottom of the scale there, you know, that lead can be, you know, melted on a, on, on a domestic fire. You know, it can be used to make really kind of low-end, cheap jewellery products. We see those from York, we see them from Dublin, we see you know, uh, uh, brooches and badges uh, you know, turned out in lead using like, quite simple uh, mould materials. You can cast lead into, uh, into you know, a deer antler, for example. It'll scorch it a bit, but it will maintain its shape and you can produce cheap end jewellery from that. So this is, this is I'm just kind of, I'm kicking this idea around a bit uh, about, you know, uh, just thinking about how to classify the types of operations because there's clearly that um, variation uh, between you know, be, it, between the different types of metal of metal working yeah you know, in the camps yeah you know, in the back back rooms of the houses in the specialist workshops yeah the, this framework's very much still a, a work in progress but I'm just wanting to kind of really drill down into into the you know, the, the types of metal working that were being carried out yeah and also thinking in terms of uh, Looking at things like composite objects, this again represents uh, an extra level of skill in metalworking. Because it's, yeah, the, yeah, what I'm calling here composite objects are yeah objects that have been made up of multiple parts that have been fabricated and then joined together. So examples like these net rings from a silver hoard found on the Baltic island of Rügen in uh, 2018 is very similar to. Uh, Net rings from the Curedale hoard, uh, Holton, Holton Moor hoard, uh, the scale hoard from Shetland that was found in 1858. Yeah, and these we have got similar objects in gold, which were found in the um, the uh, Woodkey excavations in Dublin. Yeah, and you also have objects like um, I mean these are yeah you know, while similar to yeah you know, to. Uh, uh, to the twisted neck rings, the yeah you know, well in terms of the neck ring in the middle, this is the Hidden Say hoard from Hidden Say Island off the Baltic uh, Baltic coast of Germany. Now that's yeah you know, say that's a fairly similar object to these, although the Hidden Say hoard is all gold, and the larger the larger pendants there are made of granulated gold. Yeah, you know, and these are. Yeah, you know, must be a really highly skill, yeah, you know, you know, high skill level would be need, required to produce these. Although, I don't know if you recall the um, the 
Patrice pieces from Hedderby that I showed earlier would be used in the manufacture of these to press out the design that would then have granulation added to it. But the, uh, the, but then you also have silver work like uh, this armoring from the Galloway Horde, which has been decorated with punch designs. You know, similar to the, the punch that was tri that was uh, the same principle as the punch that was used on the lead trial piece from uh, 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 from Torxy. and that might be a part of the a part of the story of these kind of more complex. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, jewelry pieces. But then at the other end of the scale, you also have what I'm, I'm referring to as more simple objects, which I do have a, a, a set of these oval brooches in here, which are this, this, I think this is a Danish pair of oval brooches, but yeah, you know, these are a ubiquitous Viking Age object that were produced in multiple places, partly by copying. The method of making moulds using ceramics could very easily be used to take an impression from a piece of jewellery that already existed. And there's good evidence from uh, the work of Soren Simbeck that the that that was a common practice in pre in producing these yeah the, this type of object and yeah and also uh, ceramic moulds could be uh, produced using lead pieces so these from Kaupang again. And there, well, that's another example of lead. This is a really, these are really simple objects. These are from the, uh, the, the win that winter camp at Torxy, and these are lead gaming pieces. As you can see, there's not really an awful lot of style or, or skill required in making those. The uh, yeah, Don Hadley and Julian Richards that have been in charge of, of, um, of investigating that site have characterized these as possibly just being made by soldiers who were, you know, who were overwintering you know, uh, in uh, that, that winter of you know, that, uh, that winter camp. Mm -hmm. or what I also classify as a fairly simple silver object is this Thor's hammer from uh, Flekstad in Norway, where the, if you come over to the Viking village tomorrow, you might actually see me making this, uh, this style of uh, Thor's hammer where a simple design is cast into a mold and then it's hammered, it's hammered thin from there and decorated using, using the punctures, you know, round punctures and dot punctures. Again, this is fairly, you know, this is fairly simple you know, uh, metal working and that is a mold for, and made of volcanic rock from Kaupang. Again, a fairly simple design has just been scratched into a soft rock and that can then be used for uh, casting pendants. So I'm trying to separate out different types of metal work just to get a, an idea of the sort of status and skill levels you know, of, yeah, of the people who were producing these, who were, who were working with them. And yeah, this leads me to a situation where I can break down the, adve uh, the activities of the non-ferrous metal workers and look at other techniques that they can that they could be using. What I'm hoping to be able to find is some kind of indication of cultural identity amongst the, the non-ferrous metal workers. The, the crucibles that I mentioned earlier, for example, those one, the ones from Kaupang, again, I must find another picture of, uh, of, of thimble-shaped crucibles, are very, are very different from a lot of the crucibles that are found in non in evidence of non-ferrous metal working in England. For example, these are bag-shaped crucibles and these are ones from Lincoln, where you can see the shape you know, of the crucibles is quite different. And I'm looking into the reasons why that might be. Yeah, um, there's some kind of technological choice going on there and I'm not sure at the moment. It's where one of the experiments I'll be carrying out is to whether, the, you know, whether there was a technological superiority between one type of crucible and another. I'm also interested in, you know, in the choice of alloys. This is um, a scrap end from the Viking burial on Colonsay. And there's been some discussion of, uh, around this kind of insular metalwork as to whether the, uh, the alloys were specifically chosen or whether they were uh, arrived at accidentally by mixing together you know, uh, different brasses and bronzes. Uh, Caroline Patterson has um, 
has analysed these and found that many of them can tell are, are basically formed of gun metal. You know, that they have a, a, you know, a mix of different metals in them. So I'm going to be looking at that. So how am I doing all this? We'll get on to where I'm actually up to. Yeah, I've talked about the workshop at Viborg Sonderzo in Denmark. That's the excavation plan of the workshop. Um, and it does appear to have been a purpose-built workshop that was built in the winter of 1018, uh, 1019. It's been very tightly dated by dendrochronology that's been carried out on the on surviving timbers. So the actual year that it was it, that the first workshop was put up is very securely dated. And that's the reconstruction drawing of it um, produced by the by the excavators. What wasn't particularly clear on there is that the post holes you see there, there's a nice row of four post holes down that side, and on the other side no corresponding post holes, particularly for that top corner. That's been really, really annoying uh, because it, most timber frame buildings would be built on a truss structure where you have pairs of posts. This one wasn't. This one would seem to have been thrown. My first thoughts really were that this, this one was thrown up by cowboys. Yeah. Um, so I, to get further into understanding the building and how I could reconstruct it, I drew my own, uh, my own frame uh, frame drawing uh, with the with the help of a good friend of mine, Nevin Carling, who's a specialist in traditional woodworking uh, from uh, the east coast of the United States. He gave me a lot of help with uh, with putting this together. The only thing I will need to change on this is that we managed to come up with an answer to the problem of mortise and tenon joints. It's a yeah. I'm a metal worker and I ended up going down this complete, uh, complete rabbit hole of looking at Viking Age timber buildings. Talk about getting distracted. Um, yeah, what we did find, yeah, we were pl initially planning on using mortise and tenon joints to actually hold this together, despite the fact that we've got uh, Julian Richards and others have, have stated that there were no mortise and tenon joints in England before the Norman Conquest. We kind of, I was, I was all ready to just ignore that until we actually started building. And basically, I got, yeah, you know, I managed to uh, get myself, yeah, you know, 20 larch trees is of decent enough size to make, uh, make timbers for this building. Yeah, we gathered up uh, hazel from local woodland that allowed us to, yeah, you know, uh, that allowed us for a donation to go and uh, harvest some uh, coppiced hazel for making the, the wattle. And using only axes, uh, basically, yeah, we're uh, using only axes and a spoon bit for drilling holes, we set to on, um, on building this reconstructed workshop. So that's, that's Nevin there, you know, supervising the, uh, the cutting down of a tree, the, the traditional way, just basically using a large felling axe. Yeah, from there, you know, we, we squared off as many of the timbers as, po uh, as we could. Uh, one of the, we were just using axes and basic scribing methods, we found that the best wood in the, these trees was towards the base. So, uh, the, yeah, the wider part of the tree was squared to give us enough timber to do the joinery with. And we quite often ended up with some of the thinner trees we ended up uh, the base of the post has actually sti uh, still been round. So we have round posts going into the ground with squared posts at the top. So this is our site at the Year Centre in York with uh, you know, squared hewn timbers. And then we managed to come up with an answer to the problem of the, the, problem of the mortise and tenon joints, really, really yeah. where it suddenly occurred to Nevin one day that, that all we really needed to do was reverse cut the mortise and tenon joints and create these bridle joints, which I subsequently found there is evidence for in Viking Age Scandinavia. And that's my PhD supervisor, Steve Ashby, actually visiting the site to see what we're up to and looking delighted. <coughs> yeah, so scribing, it, scribing on the woodwork, this, it came as a little bit of a surprise to me, not really being a woodworker or having had any great success with woodworking before that this was the yeah this was the optimum way of preparing the of preparing these timbers to have joints cut in them 
Yeah, and then, you know, then use the spoon bit auger to drill out holes and then an axe to cut out these bridles. Okay, it gives us some surprisingly strong joints on, tim on timbers that are you know, about 15 centimetres uh, across. And that was the basic framework of this workshop. This workshop here is five metres by three metres. Uh, yeah. And once I actually got this up into the ground, uh, yeah, yeah, standing up, I was kind of slightly surprised by how big that is. So we have quite a, a space inside. Uh, the entire framework is made of wood. I mean, it, I've built an awful lot of replicas over the years. I've, I've made a lot of replicas of Viking Age objects. Uh, this is the largest replica of anything I've ever built. Uh, so the whole thing is held together with, uh, with ash pegs. You know, that was, you know uh, so I was putting, um, you know, you know, up on the top of it, um, cutting, the, uh, cutting the notches for putting rafters on. So that's where we are. It doesn't yet have a roof on it. I am hoping to get a roof on by the, by the winter. Uh, but what I'm planning on doing for the roof is putting, is using a planked roof, which I have a plan for doing this. And at that point, I am going to completely abandon the, uh, the traditional woodworking methods and get, um, get my friend who has some, uh, some trees and a friend who has a chainsaw, uh, uh, chainsaw attachment called an Alaskan sawmill. I'm going to get them both together and we're going to make some boards to go on the roof of this because while I am essentially reconstructing an archaeological site in the future, this should be, this should be uh, an archaeological experiment that can be excavated. Uh, I don't think I need to go as far as hand hewing 20 square meters of planks to, to do that. I think that's a little bit beyond the scope of uh, the scope of my experiment. We have, uh, me and my friend Ulf here, have made a door uh, for, for this, just to have a go at splitting uh, some of these trees and turning them into planks. We basically managed to whittle a door over the course of about two weeks. So that gives you some idea of how long it would take us to do the entire roof in hand-hewn planks. So uh, we're not planning on doing that. And that's pretty much as I left it with a, uh, having started on the wattle walling uh, before, I, uh, before I started going away to events and uh, giving talks about it. So when I get back into York in, uh, uh, in October, I'm hoping to get this finished and get a roof on it before the weather gets bad. So that's uh, the current state of the building. Now, I wouldn't have been able to get, uh, get this far at all, it has to be said, without this guy, Nevin. You know, in some respects, I do like to think of him as a true analogue for the Viking Age builders of the original structure. I did mention that it looked like it had been thrown together by cowboys. The, pla the ground plan was, is, yeah, rather, I think that my preferred term at the moment is idiosyncratic. It uh, really does not look like it was, it was the best building, possibly a bit light in structure uh, uh, and really not you know, what we would expect from a high status Viking building at all. So it looks like it's very much, very much looks like it's a low status building. But my insight, it, I've gained some insight into why that may, might be from Nevin, the, uh, the, the traditional woodworker. He, yeah, he can build, a, uh, build amazing things. He's worked with uh, a group of um, uh, French, woodwork French and American woodworkers who are, uh, are pitching to uh, get, get let loose on rebuilding the roof of Notre Dame Cathedral. You know, these guys really, really know their stuff. Yeah. But in this building, I like to think that this picture personifies my, fa my favourite term that he came up with, that the problem he was having was that the timber he was working with was not prime. I think that was him being very polite. Some days I saw him like almost having a bit of a, a bit of a cow over just how not prime the timber was, particularly this wall plate, which is the one you can see here, which we ended up leaving mostly round because once we got the bark off it, it was quite clear that the grain was pretty much like a corkscrew. It's one really seriously twisted tree. So that's an Evan wondering how on earth He's going to turn this twisted tree into a usable piece of timber, but we managed it. But this, this therefore required compromises in Nevin's best practice. He used 
in some respects, I'd like to think of him as being like a true analogue for the builders of the original structure because his skill level was such that he was able to take not prime timber and turn it into a working structure. So I owe an awful lot to him and learned an awful lot from him. Now, what I'm going to do next in that structure is my process case studies. I've already talked about some of these, but here's some of the, um, the crucibles from York. So there, you can just about, in, my, in this slightly dodgy picture I took at the Yorvik Viking Centre, you can see this type of crucible. They're very much the same kinds of crucibles. We see those in both Scandinavia and in Britain. Um, you know, we see the, these thimble-shaped crucibles. Then we also have the bag-shaped Stamford Ware crucibles, which Ailsa Mainman, uh, uh, at York Archaeological Trust, has suggested that the use of uh, these type of crucibles made of Stamford Ware could be a reason why uh, the Anglo-Scandinavian people of York started using Stamford Ware cooking vessels. It could be that by them buying, buying in crucibles, that opened the door for, uh, for Stamford Ware to come in, so into York. So what I'm interested is in is why they started using these different types of crucibles. So I'm, pl I'm planning on doing that by actualistic testing of the two different types against each other, see if I can figure out if one was superior to the other. You know, the, at this point, it's entirely possible that uh, the Stamford Ware uh, crucibles could just be uh, used as a result of the training you, uh, of, the, of the metal worker. It's entirely possible, I wouldn't rule anything out at this, mo this point in time, it might be an indication that those metal workers in Viking Age York weren't actually Scandinavians at all if they're favouring a different type of crucible. But I'm going to go away and test this, so watch this space for results on, on that one. I'll maybe come back and talk about that another time. We'll see how that goes. And I'm also going to be investigating the, you know, the, uh, the joining methods for composite objects as things stand, yeah, uh, any analysis or description of these kind of twisted silver, uh, silver objects will talk about the style, will talk about the classifications of the shapes. Nobody I've come across has ever, has ever mentioned how you join the ends of these together. So, you, uh, yeah, in the modern workshop with a propane torch, yeah, uh, hard solder, an easy solder, and a big tub of borax, I can quite easily join the terminals onto, an art, onto a net ring like that. But how that was actually carried out in the Viking Age workshop is basically still something of a mystery. Yeah, so I've, I'm going to be testing methods of, yeah, of doing that. I was actually mixing up um, uh, flux using a, uh, a 12th century recipe in the workshop today. That was kind of fun. Yeah, I'm also, as I've mentioned, going to be looking at uh, comp uh, metal compositions of, yeah, of copper alloy objects, particularly these uh, insular objects like uh, ring pins from, well, that's, actually that's a ring pin from Coppergate in York, although exactly the same style of ring pins are also known from Dublin and they're quite possibly being made in Dublin. That's another piece of that Colin Say uh, sword fittings. And this is, yeah, uh, I've, I've I had a rather abortive attempt at, make it, at uh, making one of these, uh, uh, reproducing this belt buckle from Carlisle Cathedral I, I, uh, during my uh, master's project, where basically I had a mix, of, uh, a mix of copper alloy that did not want to get beaten into, into shape and it cracked and my annealing was not, not terribly successful using the, using the forge. So I'm revisiting that style, that style of metal working and I want to crack exactly, so to speak, I want to understand exactly how they were made because all of these objects were made by, by hammering out uh, ingots of copper alloy. Uh, and I will be looking at casting, partly because I've had a bee in my bonnet for about, uh, about 15 years of, of making this, uh, this brooch from the uh, from the scar boat burial, and partly because, according to Ian Peterson at the University of Oslo, uh, 
analysis of um, of the not uh, of the metal working workshops at uh, at Kaupang shows a, a greater weighting towards casting material, and yeah, uh, and the, these workshops have been classified as as bronze casting workshops in the past, whereas the uh, working of yeah yeah. You get you know, far more of uh, of these ceramic moulds, whereas the working of uh, uh, making wrought objects, yeah, um, leaves less trace in the archaeological record. So yeah, that's my excuse to go and do uh, do some casting as well. Oh, yeah, I want to try it out. I want to want to get good at that. Although it's been examined by many people before, so the process is well understood. There's not really an awful lot to be gained uh, from yeah you know, from xeroxing effectively from copying. Yeah, the, uh, the the casting method that's been established by uh, by others, apart from in that kind of long term uh, that long term reconstruction of the of the workshop contexts. Uh, this is a spatial analysis of that workshop from Viborg Sonderzo, which yeah, yeah, that, yeah. This is here to illustrate that I want to be able to reconstruct not just the structure, I want to reconstruct the archaeological site. So that the, a workshop that was originally there for only four, uh, for eight years in the, in the early 11th century in, in Denmark, you know, I don't envisage being you know, uh, at the, uh, you know, standing at the year centre for any great length of time. I want, uh, I'm going to be, uh, I'm purposely building an archaeological site, essentially. But the main point of using this workshop, aside from investigating you know, all the physical aspects of it, is to examine the interpersonal workshop dynamics. I want to understand physical movements and social interactions of the people who inhabited these spaces in the Viking Age. Using use of space analysis, I want to reconstruct how it was, how the workshop was used. Yeah, I want to examine whether the people who were there were independent actors who formed their own small network of communication and cooperation, working towards production of, you know, of specific objects for markets that could have been local or international. And because these people form a network hub with links to wider networks of tool makers, metal suppliers, and possibly even merchants in the wider Viking world. And what we don't really know, and what I consider the first step in understanding this properly, is to understand the the workshop dynamics, how people were using that space. Essentially what I'm looking to reconstruct is the, how people worked within the space. Yeah, I'm also interested in uh, the learning mechanisms, the way in which that small, that small scale network was used to train the next generation of non-ferrous metal workers, which roles of the operation and workshop were suited to learning skills from the workshop master. And I'm hoping to throw light on mechanisms that enable non-ferrous metal workers to refine and develop their art so that they could spread their styles around the Viking Age world. And this comes down to identifying technical choices used to manufacture objects. It's the case that an artisan is more likely to use a method that they were trained in than, say, to invent their own uh, techniques. And they might develop or apply it to new objects, but their training should, in first instance, should be it should be their first instinct in making any object. So by identifying the techniques used, I hope to be able to trace the communication routes that, are, uh, that they use to spread these techniques around the Viking world. And this then leads to a greater understanding of trade and communication links across Europe. So, in conclusion, I hope I've been uh, made a reasonable go at uh, explaining what I'm hoping to achieve with the fine detail reconstruction of the working methods, uh, because this approach goes far, uh, far beyond simply reconstructing objects, simply making things. We can do that in any mod modern jeweler's workshop I do on a daily basis. Uh, I can produce results that look exactly like you know, Viking Age objects. What I'm hoping to achieve with this project is not just understanding how the original pieces were made, but who the people that made them were. Because we can't really uh, uh, reconstruct their personal experience because they were different from us. They believed different things from us. They understood the transformative techniques that they used in a completely different conceptual framework. But 
by approaching the material culture in this way, I'm hoping to build a new way of understanding not just the biography of the objects themselves, but the life ways and daily experience of those artisans that were producing them. So while we can never know exactly what they were thinking, I do believe that if I can reconstruct their lives, then we can reconstruct and at least see the movement of their hands. So thank you for listening. That seems to have all gone very blue. If you want to learn uh, more about my project, follow uh, Between the Hammer and the Anvil on Facebook. Um, also on Instagram. Uh, and there is a YouTube channel as well, although I am waiting to, I need some time to edit some video together. I've got loads of video of the, uh, of the building process for the workshop. So I'm just, I just need to get all of that together. Thank you very much, Logs.